Elijah received a call from God in the midst of one of the darkest times in Israel's history. Elijah was a Tishbite from the region of Gilead in Transjordan. He is regarded as one of the most important prophets in Israel's history. Even though there is no book written in his honor, the book Kings covers a greater portion of his life than the lives of most kings. Elijah was a famous prophet who lived in the 9th century and worked in the northern kingdom during the reigns of Ahab and his son Ahaziah. Despite the specific commands given to Israel to not mix the worship of pagan gods with the worship of the true God, King Ahab encouraged the Israelites to mix their worship of the true God with the worship of these pagan gods and pagan methods of worship. He did this by setting an example for them to follow. In Israel, idolatry had developed into a significant social issue. For the sins, Elijah told Ahab that Israel would experience a drought. And Elijah said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. 1 Kings 17 1 Elijah collapsed to the ground, exhausted. The message of the drought, the idolatry of Samaria, the wrath of King Ahab, and the dawning comprehension that he couldn't return home were sufficient to overwhelm him. But Elijah had faith. He decided to submit to God's will and establish his home by the Cherith Brook. After a while, the, the brook dried up. Elijah witnessed the brook's flow diminish until it finally ceased altogether. His access to water had been cut off. In an area of land like Israel, rain and dew were life-giving and life-preserving necessities. Elijah finally got the drought that he prayed for. Even though it was necessary for his survival, he did not pray for more rain to fall. Even though it made his life more difficult, he prioritized carrying out the will of God. 1 Kings 17, 8-9 Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. God led Elijah from the dry brook to a Gentile city. This was a unique and challenging move for Elijah to make. God kept transplanting Elijah from home to Jezreel to Cherith to Zarephath. This transplanting made him stronger and stronger. We should also remember that this was the broad region from which the wicked Queen Jezebel was. Elijah was visiting enemy territory and showing the power of God in an area where Baal was worshipped, though ineffective through drought. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. In the ancient world, widows had a reputation for living in abject poverty. Widows remained on the fringes of society, often living in complete dependence on the graces of the local community, and they were occasionally forced into prostitution. Widows wore unique garments that expressed their social standing. Genesis 38, 19, Amplified Bible. Then she got up and left, and removed her veil and put on her widow's clothing. Widows, orphans, and prostitutes occupied the lowest possible position in the social order and were typically on the verge of starvation and homelessness. Widows lived in constant fear of their next meal because their daily lives were so unpredictable. Elijah was instructed by God to go to a widow who was a Gentile and receive provision from her. However, it probably seemed more logical to wait beside a dry brook. When his people rejected him, Jesus used this example of Elijah's coming to the widow of Zarephath 
as an illustration of God's right to choose a people for himself. Luke 4, 24-26 Then he said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But in truth, I say to you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was closed up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was not sent by the Lord to a single one of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. 1 Kings 17, 10-11 So he set out and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks for firewood. He called out to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a jar so that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please, bring me a piece of bread in your hand. Indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. This revealed that she was a woman living in poverty because she was collecting scraps for use as firewood. Elijah probably thought that God would lead him to an unusually wealthy widow. But instead, God led him to a widow who was a Gentile and she was poor. You can deduce this from the fact that she did not even have any firewood. There was no bread shortage at the time, and there was no shortage of wood. So the only explanation for this is that she was extremely impoverished. She was thinking about feeding her son and herself upon the last cake. She had no idea of sustaining a man of God out of that empty barrel of meal. Yet the Lord, who never lieth, spoke a solemn truth when he said, I have commanded a widow woman there. He had so operated upon her mind that he had prepared her to obey the command when it did come by the lip of his servant, the prophet. Please bring me a little water in a cup. Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Elijah put forward this request with courage and faith. Faith compelled him to ask, despite the fact that common sense in the given circumstances indicated that the widow would not give so generously to a stranger. This was certainly putting the widow's faith to an extraordinary trial, to take and give to a stranger of whom she knew nothing. The small pittance requisite to keep her child from perishing was too much to be expected. God indeed chose this woman, but he chose her for more than a miracle. He chose her for service. The choice of this woman, while it brought such blessedness to her, involved service. She was not selected to be saved in the famine, but to feed the prophet. She must be a woman of faith, she must make the little cake first, and afterward she shall have the multiplication of the meal and the oil. So the grace of God does not choose men to sleep and wake up in heaven, nor choose them to live in sin and find themselves absolved at last, nor choose them to be idle and go about their own worldly business, and yet to win a reward at the latest for which they never toil. Ah, no. The sovereign electing grace of God chooses us to repentance, faith, and afterward to the holiness of living, Christian service, zeal, and devotion. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. See, I am gathering a few sticks so that I may go in and bake it for me and my son, that we may eat it as our last meal and die. We read, As the Lord your God lives. It was clear from her respectful address that she revered God, but at the same time she understood that God of Israel was Elijah's God and not her own. She said, 
I do not have bread. Elijah learned very quickly that she was not only poor, but impoverished to an extreme degree. Elijah came upon her just as she was about to prepare the final bite of food for both herself and her son, and then they were both going to resign themselves to their impending deaths. 1 Kings 17, 13-14 Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. Just make me a little bread from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and one for your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain again on the face of the earth. Elijah said, Do not fear. This was the first word that God spoke to the widow by way of Elijah. Her current predicament gave her good reason to be afraid, but God wanted her to cast aside her fear and replace it with trust in Him instead. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. This request made by the prophet was extremely audacious and brazen. He approached this destitute widow and requested that she give him a portion of the food that was left in her bowl. It appeared as though this was an example of the most dishonest form of fundraising. We then read, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. This explains why Elijah was able to make such a bold request in the first place. For this reason, God had informed him that he would supply an endless supply of food for the widow, her son, and Elijah himself. He encouraged the widow to place her faith in the beautiful promise that God had made. 1 Kings 17, 15-16 she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, in accordance with the word of the Lord which he spoke through Elijah. The widow actually did it. She willingly gave at great risk based on her trust in the promise of God. She and he and her household ate for many days. The promise that God had made to the widow, her son and Elijah was eventually carried out. Because God used her as a conduit for supply, God was able to meet all of her requirements through her. We can see the wisdom with her food not coming all at once. She depended on God daily. 1 Kings 17, 17 to 18. It happened after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What problem is there between you and me, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to mind and to put my son to death? We read, After these things, that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. We can imagine the happy days of the provision in the widow's household, a continuing miracle of God supplied their needs. Despite this, the happy times were eventually overshadowed by a cloud of gloom brought about by the widow's son's illness and subsequent passing. The widow was already grieving the loss of her husband when her son passed away. Not only did she suffer the pain that any mother would feel after the death of a child, but she also suffered the pain of someone who had lost the one and only hope she had for the future. It was hoped that her son would grow up to be successful and provide for her when she got older. 
Now, however, those hopes were dashed completely. Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? The widow placed an indirect amount of blame on Elijah for the passing of her son. She laid a greater amount of direct blame on herself and her unnamed transgression. Whatever it was that she had done wrong, the memory of her guilt over it was never far from her. 1 Kings 17, 19-20 He said to her, Give me your son. Then he took him from her arms and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. He called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you brought further tragedy to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? He took him out of her arms. This vivid detail shows that the widow clutched the dead child tightly, the upper room where he was staying. The term upper room refers to a temporary shelter or room on the roof, accessible from outside the house. Such structures are common in the Near East. This arrangement would allow the widow not only her needed privacy, but would safeguard her reputation, Patterson and Austell. Then he cried out to the Lord. Elijah prayed to God with all of his heart and had a close relationship with God. In prayer, he asked God to shed some light on this tragedy that seemed beyond explanation and beyond redemption. Since he knew God led him to this widow, Elijah laid this tragedy on God and asked him to mend it. 1 Kings 17, 21-24 Then he stretched himself out upon the child three times and called to the Lord God and said, O Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the lower part of the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. He stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord. This was an unusual prayer method, but Elijah had no precedent. It was not because of his prayer technique, but because of his faith that God responded to this prayer. We read, then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. The son was brought back to life, and God provided for the widow in every way, not only by providing a miraculous supply of food, but also by bringing her son back to life after he had been dead. God's compassion will always reach out to us when we hold on to him tenaciously till it brings freedom from the limitations of the past. Struggling with a life that has been so empty can be quite tough, but when God steps in, there is bound to be real changes. Elijah's visitation brought about that sudden change that led to a new beginning for that family. God's grace is able to create a way where there has been no way forward. Even when we feel that our background limits us and our history doesn't qualify us for certain things in life, we can focus on the examples God shows us in the scriptures to receive encouragement and strength to face the future. However, there were men that refused to obey God. To watch that video, click here.